Make-in sessions are thematic online panel discussions hosted by Make-in, featuring guests from across creative culture. Sessions allow us to have longer, in-depth conversations on single topics with interesting people from around the globe. It's a format that is open for others to listen in and ask questions. In this Megan session, we spoke with Sarah Kim and Ariel M. Myers, two of the three curators of Feminine Product, an art exhibition centered around the discussion of women and equality held in Los Angeles in March 2017. Sarah Kim, founder of By Way Of, has been featured in a previous Megan story, figuring out female equality together. Ariel M. Myers is a curator previously at the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art and is now an independent curator located in Denver. We also invited two women whose work was included in the exhibition to speak with us. Carmen Chan, a professional commercial and editorial photographer, and Vanessa Yuri Chung, a visual artist and practicing arts educator. We discussed the need for all women art shows and creative initiatives in response to a gender ratio imbalance in the arts world and a still changing societal attitude towards females. Another theme that came up was how feminism is defined differently by not only exhibition attendees, but the artists who were invited to exhibit. Ariel M. Myers brought up the importance of companies being mindful of a commitment to put money into their values and investing in diversity. Carmen Chan highlighted other women-specific initiatives and her experience with how some clients will thoughtfully consider whether the subject at hand might be better suited to be portrayed through a female gaze. We ended the session by talking about practical ways to nurture young creatives and encourage the community at large. Sarah Kim emphasized that there's enough room for everyone, female and male, and that bringing up new talent doesn't mean putting yourself in the shadows. As a heads up, there are a couple moments where a few of the guests didn't have a great connection, so the audio can be spotty in some areas. Okay, so since we're all here, do you guys want to get started? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for all being so on time. Um, so we have people here, they're present, they can hear us, they can chat to us, uh, right? This is the case. Oh, and for those who are tuning in, if you want to ask questions at any time, there is a Q&A button in the top right, and we'll be able to field them as we go along. So just to start off, I'm gonna give a short explanation of Make It. We're an audiovisual publication and community that features the sights and sounds of creative culture. We're currently membership-based and you can sign up for a free trial at makein.com. Um, one thing we're really excited about is being able to host sessions like today's and we get to just see more insight into aspects of the creative community. So we've invited four women who are each professionally involved in the creative industry in different ways. And how about we start with an introduction from each of the panelists. Uh, Sarah, do you wanna start? Yeah, hi guys, I'm Sarah. Um, I have a magazine called By Way Of, formerly By Way Of Brooklyn, but then I moved to Los Angeles, so now it's By Way Of. <laughs> um, and it is a magazine that features entrepreneurial um, women and the creative circles around them. So I'm the editor-in-chief there, and then we just posted this amazing, um, can you say self-proclaimed amazing? Amazing, um, our exhibition called Feminine Product, um, which Ariel curated, um, and then Carmen and Vanessa were a part of. Oh, Ariel, do you want to go to yeah. um, I'm Ariel Myers. I'm a curator. I was at the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art until about two months ago, and now I'm kind of working as an independent curator with a consulting firm in Denver called Mind.Arts. And I'm doing like 
every type of project you can imagine. Residences and hotels and uh, concept like visioning for new galleries. So like big picture stuff and kind of small stuff. So lots of cool things now. Okay, uh, Vanessa? Hi, um, I'm a visual artist and my practice focuses on drawing and painting, um, but I also am a practicing arts educator. Um, I study fine arts and the visual and performing arts education at UCLA and I've taught at several art, like Los Angeles elementary and middle schools. And I'm an upcoming graduate student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Ooh. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Hi, Dave. Uh, Carmen? Hi, I'm Carmen. I am a professional photographer. Uh, I've been shooting for about seven years and I shoot commercial and editorial work, um, specializing in lifestyle, fashion, <clears throat> and portraits, um, especially environmental portraits. Um, and the a feminine product was my first uh, gallery show. So, gallery Thank show. you. Awesome. So you guys kind of already mentioned it, and the reason that we brought four of you specifically together today is because Sarah and Ariel helped curate this show in LA this past March called Feminine Product, and Carmen and Vanessa were two of the exhibiting artists. So just to begin the conversation, can Ariel and Sarah talk about how you first came up with the idea? Yeah, so um, I had made this magazine and it took me a really long time to make our second issue only because uh, print costs money, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of money. And um, the only way that I could sort of get it sold in with our sponsors, um, who was Creative Rec Women's, who actually are making really good looking shoes, um, said they would do it, but we had to sort of have an event. Um, because people don't want to pay for events and they don't, not that they don't want to pay for print, but it's always like an addition versus being the main thing, which is my current struggle. Um, so we said, we'll throw an event. And then Edison Chen, who is awesome um, and is friends with my husband and his business partner, um, he has a beautiful space downtown that he's hosted lots of pop-ups at, lots of different events. Um, and he offered it to me and our third curator, Lindsay, who's not here. Um, but Lindsay, and so we went from there and we're like, well, what should we do? You know, uh, for me to just have had a second issue launch party felt a bit um, <laughs> like a waste of time and space. Like if we're going to yeah. get other people together, then we really wanted to do it in a way that was meaningful, you know, and I think that there are a lot of places that you go where you have a drink and you run into people, but there's not a lot of places where you have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Lindsay and I were like, okay, let's have an art show or an art gallery, you know, like let's have an art show here. And then you know, like, we don't curate, <laughs> maybe we should bring on a curator. And then Ariel was like, ding. And I've known Ariel for years. So it was like for when she was studying to like when she was curating to like, man, we could be top part and this could be like this mutually beneficial thing. Um, and then Ariel got involved. Um, yeah, it's funny because I started like just trying to be around Sarah when I was like 18 or 19 living <laughs> in New York and like just saw that what she was doing with By Way Of and, and her goals towards what that might look like in the future was something that I really wanted to be involved with and have written something in both in both uh, print issues and then so I guess didn't you call just to be like I'm trying to do an art show you're in the arts what do you think and I was like yes, do this. I'm a curator now that's what I do and so it was <laughs> a great moment of like oh wow we can actually like really work together and um, just like start putting together concepts of what how we can set up the concept like, okay we know we're starting with this level of it's going to be all women but then like what bigger conversations mm. are we having on top of that? Uh, and how did you, for Carmen and Vanessa, how was this pitch to you? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess just friend of a friend. Sarah's graphic designer, Nari, is a, you know, peer from UCLA, and she actually just, you know, approached me and Sally, another, you know, artist in the exhibit and she said you know I have this friend who's organizing a show and you know I think your work would fit right in and so 
connections. <laughs> you know. Well, it's also just like being the person that came into mind when you guys were having this theme, I guess. How about you, Carmen? Um, it was pitched to me by Sarah, <laughs> and I've contributed to by way of um, previously in New York. And so um, she told me about the idea for this show and and um, like I mentioned, I usually shoot commercial and editorial, and, and so I don't have um, like specific personal work, but I think she kind of, it was nice because I think she, like Sarah and Ariel saw my work in a different way that I did. Um, so she asked specifically for my body of work from Fashion Week, and we kind of extracted, um, I sent her a wider edit, and, and she, you know, identified work that would, you know, speak to that. So, yeah artists that we really liked and didn't know them maybe and yeah. just so it was like kind of a cold call and then we, we were able to identify artists who we weren't sure like if their work would like fit typically like I think for Carmen's like I had seen so much of what she had shot for like Ethereal and like Everlane we came from you know in all these beautiful places but you know for her I think in particular it was like you shot all the behind the scenes from Fashion Week and like these are all not moments that have been published. Like Women's Wear Daily wouldn't have published that shot, right? Mm -hmm. That behind the scene uh, or rolling up her stocking or like fixing her fake eyelash or getting her name, whatever it was, like the moment. Um, so I think with people who are friends also and artists that inspired were able to figure out what works work best. What so a question for all four of you is why do you feel or why did you feel back in February or March that an all women art show is necessary? So probably I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean I was just thinking about, you know, this interview yesterday night and thinking about the definition of being a woman and just womanhood and that definition in that meeting is, you know, evolving and changing like constantly and currently and you know even in February we're still you know seeing changes in that definition and you know this space was a space to showcase that you know and the the faces and the bodies and just the people involved and in, you know creating visual I guess experiences of that womanhood. Uh, Arielle, I think you wanted to say something as well. Yeah, I mean, for me, I come out of, you know, art history background. I have my master's in art history, and I was teaching and kind of had this plan to be a professor and was on the trajectory for that. And so, like, having this very academic background, you know, you kind of study, like, historical exhibitions that have been only women and kind of looking at where those exhibitions, like the role that they filled, but you know, we couldn't do that exact same exhibition today and it just wouldn't have the same resonance like trying to do Woman House today. It just wouldn't have the same yeah. feeling. And those are some conversations that Sarah and I had in the beginning was like, you know, trying to put ourselves in this framework of a pretty long history of women trying to work together, just women, to create a space that, you know, brings to light the fact that even in you know, most institutions, um, the ratio of men to women in exhibitions is just higher. And so mm -hmm. um, it seems kind of counterintuitive sometimes to like carve out that space because what we really want is equality. But uh, right. I think, you know, starting from that point of like, okay, well, where are we at right in this moment? And what can we do to make this show feel really relevant to the women that are working today? And yeah, what, what kind of needs do they have what do they want to see out of a show yeah there are enough things for boys <laughs> <laughs> we already have enough there's enough okay. like shows and like show implies like either it, and you know what we struggled too it's like Lindsay, Ariel, and I too was like do we have to make it so feminine you know do we have to say like female like do you mm. have to say that and again what Ariel said like it's almost counter it's counterproductive sometimes you would you would think well, like I had a friend Sam and Sam was like Sarah like I Sam. whenever I'm doing something it's with all female DJs I just look back and see that it happened to have been all female versus like 
calling it that. And I was like, I, I think that we as creative women are maybe there, but I don't think we as sort of a society are there. So you have okay. to, that. you have to sort of, um, make that the tagline. I think right now, not in the years to come, but now you can go to it. And like, I've had people also say about the magazine, like, Oh, I didn't realize that this was the, like, all the, like you feature one guy in here and the rest are female. And I love that, you know, like it's, it's, you read it, you like the imagery, like you love the words, but you wouldn't outwardly know. And I don't feel like we need to harp on it, but for something like this, that's so visual that God forbid we include a, a guy or two guys and like someone's work gets mis like misconstrued or mislabeled, you know, like let's just make it very clear. Like this is for women. I think that's women. where the title kind of like came in too, is where yeah. like, we don't want to try to make it something that is overly feminine, but almost like attacks that idea. So, you know, it's like feminine product. It's like, it does hearken to like, and even sometimes I'll see like in the hashtag, um, on Instagram, like there's like things that are tagged under feminine product that are like literally about tampons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it does kind of like attack, you know, that idea that like everything feminine is going to be this like flowery, beautiful, like flowery thing. And so I think we were like, okay, just, just going to go right for it. Yeah. Um, so one thing Sarah brought up is that you think that it continues to be necessary now, but then hopefully in now, sometime in the future, it won't be necessary. So would you say that you foresee in these next couple of years that we still need to be doing all women initiatives? And when can we stop doing that? I don't know. I think we will have to be doing all women initi initiatives for <laughs> I guess it's a personal thing, right? Like if you don't feel, don't feel as if you know, that's not an issue for you, maybe let's say, or you're, or for, you know, the friend that felt like, you know, I'm hiring enough people where I don't need to say it's neither here nor there, female or, or male, like more power to you. But for me and what we were doing, um, I think it makes it much easier to carve that out and like to say it. And then there's a movement behind it very quickly. So I feel like to be a feminist right now is a bit trendy, which I'm all for the trend, right? But I would be curious in the years to come, maybe after our president is out you know, um, and whatnot, like what that would look like, right? So do we need to continue to have these things? I think until you personally feel that, you do like Carmen, I wonder, you know, like I'm a female photographer, you know, like oh, goodness, I mean, this is the greatest female tennis player of all time. You know, it's like, how, how long do we need to be saying these things? I don't know actually what the answer to that is. It's I think until I feel it, you know, because to me it was so obvious that it was going to be all women versus mm -hmm. like, let's not like, I think the title maybe was what we had toyed with a bit, but the fact that it needs to be all women, that was set, you know, that was <laughs> Got it. I don't know. Until, yeah. until I feel otherwise, I guess, and until people personally feel, <laughs> women personally feel otherwise, you know, some women already feel that way, yeah. um, and others don't. I think. Uh, go for it. I think. No, no, just, go, 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 you go. Know, until all of the like, I guess, identities that make up women, you know, trans women, um, women of color, undocumented women, and etc. Like until they're, they have spaces within, you know it'll still be necessary because we're still mm. not including everyone it has to, you know, we have to have these inclusive spaces. So, um, you know, these initiatives, these art shows, these spaces that are all women, um, are still evolving. And so I think they're still necessary. Still evolving. Uh, question for Carmen and Vanessa. Carmen mentioned that this was your first show and I'm wondering if since March, you guys have kind of sought out to be part of more things that are similar to like this, or now when you evaluate collaborating with people, you keep in mind the possibility of something being, uh, having a stronger stance to it. Hmm. Vanessa, you can go. Oh. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, I think, you know, this show, a lot of our friends came, um, a lot of my friends came out and it was kind of a spark and dialogue about just these spaces. You know, Sarah and I met a couple times after and a lot of the conversations we had were still about, like still around being a woman in the industry, um, you know, and we were able to refer back to this show. And so if that was a conversation we had, you know, mm -hmm. 
just to think of other people who came to the show on a whim or just because they stopped by. Um, you know, I actually am a part of this group, this collective called Asian Women, Asian Mamas in the Arts, working in the arts. And okay. um, it was kind of, you know, something that I thought about after uh, the show where, you know, we need these spaces, these you know, very intentional spaces that um, are kind of platforms for dialogue that we have and we can have every day, you know? And so, yeah. <laughs> Actually going out and, and doing these kinds of shows is a big thing too, especially like, again, just like my experience coming out of the Academy like we talk a lot about it and we read a lot of like theory and whatever and we have these kind of like utopian ideals of what it might look like when you know women of color and trans women and all these like kind of hyphenated you know versions of what we imagine womanhood being you know until all of those identities are represented and that's something that's talked about a huge deal but until like there are people who are going out and just continuing to produce more content continuing to produce more shows and more occasions more events so we're getting together and actually having dialogue about these things. Um, yeah. You know, that's like the biggest thing. It's like creating that footprint where, you know, somebody else can walk in that and, and creating like a pattern of doing it. And, you know, just thinking about it and talking about it and like, what do those spaces look like? And imagining them, that's very powerful. But until we actually are, you know, establishing a pattern of doing it, I, I don't mm. think it's going to be. Working. It's not time to stop yet. Right. We need to move closer towards that. Yeah. Uh, so both. Vanessa and Ariel, you guys have kind of hit on these conversations that were started as a result of the show in March. And mm -hmm. one of my questions is, what was the reception you got from putting this on? Like positive or negative or confusion, anything that you received? Literally all been positive. <laughs> ah, that's amazing. <laughs> no, because these spaces don't yeah. really exist as much. Um, yeah. And every time they come up or they're created, people embrace it. Um, and I think Sarah, Ariel, and Lindsay did a great job in including, you know, different groups of people. And they're really mindful of that. Um, I, I remember a conversation that we had in um, my apartment when they first kind of came to a studio visit um, about including, you know, women of color specifically being intentional of doing that. And then that carried out in the conversations that we had after the show, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. We were really trying to achieve that without tokenizing people. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, oh, we have a box to check. We need a black artist from New York and a black artist from LA. We need a white artist from New York and a white artist from LA. It starts to feel like really silly when you start to put it in those terms, but it was really just sprung out of like finding people, choosing work that we liked, and then really dialoguing about like dialoguing and working towards the end. Yeah. Well, do you guys have any examples of public feedback that weren't from friends and family? I'm kind of curious. Yeah, I had a few, like, um, we were there on Saturday and Sunday. So opening night was Friday night, and then Saturday and Sunday we held it through the weekend. And it was, you know, you expect, like, your friends and family to join, and that's fine and, like, come through. But I think they had people who had seen it on Instagram or wherever they had seen it. And, like, there's someone who's a school teacher in, like, Echo Park, and it's, like, she teaches at a she teaches like violin with to all these students and like dance and take orchestra. Um and felt like something like that was really important. Like something like that was really I keep breaking up, don't I? Just a little bit. I can mostly get it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um it was really cool to see other people that we didn't know and how they had shown yeah. up. Or to have people who had followed the artists. For so yeah. like for so long yeah. come through and get to see them because they might have not been able to have their own show maybe didn't want to but then being included a part of a bigger show um it was really interesting to see people who had come that we didn't know or like friends of friends who were actually much more encouraging they don't I don't know it's because they don't know our story they don't they haven't seen us try and fail or what <laughs> it was really okay. cool for people to be like hey it was really there needs to be more of this. How often? Yeah. I was like, you know what? Not that often. <laughs> I'll do it again soon. How are people interacting with the work? Was Did questions come up as a result of the work? Because some of the work, uh, Eugene has been showing it as we talk, 
it's not some of it's approachable and some of it is less approachable. Uh, prime example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Jasmine yeah. Barnes, who is a poet, and we um, we put some of her kind of like smaller fragments of poems. Um, we use vinyl to put them on the ground. Yeah, yeah. We um, used it in one of our promos. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that piece was really, really powerful, I think, because of not just I mean, her words are super powerful about the placement and like thinking about how people interacted with them as a visual art piece, like pushing it beyond. Cause she's done, I mean, she's kind of working as a visual artist in a way because she does take her words and make like these large installations with them. And so um, that was one of the really interesting ones to see how people interacted with it because, you know, some of them were like inspiring, some of them were controversial and just kind of watching how people move through the space and like, you know, some people really treated the words on the floor like they were these holy objects, like just like kind of clustering around them, reading them, them with the people that they came with. And then other people were just like walking right over them, didn't even really notice, or like mm -hmm. stopped to take like a cute shoe selfie and then were like, okay, bye. And, <laughs> and then, you know, that was one of the pieces that I think really lived on online. Like people were really posting that, reacting to that. Yeah. Um, I think. You know, that kind of one where the reception was really interesting just to see how different people were consuming that particular piece of work. I think, too, it was interesting to see. Well, you guys didn't see the work on the back end, but it was like me, Ariel, and Lindsay, like fighting about which pieces should be included and not. And like the mm. three of us are very different, just as. We have to, like Lindsay's the one that has dirty dishes. Ariel's a curator, and then I'm like a, a magazine editor, or I'm an editor. And so um, it was really tough, I think, even amongst us to decide what was going to be added into the show. Um, and some of the work, like one curator felt really strongly about, and the other two were like, You feel strong about it? All right. You know, we're where some of, you know, and vice versa. So I think it was interesting to see the reception for some of those more controversial pieces, like um, mm. like Lindsay's Dirty Dishes, let's say, for example. Or, um, yeah, Jasmine Man's, there's one, what was it? Don't don't have sex with the guy that won't eat you out first. Right? <laughs> yeah. Are we really going to include that? Are we not going to include that? Like, what does it mean if we don't include it? You know, and just going through this whole internal, like, mental and emotional and then and then having to speak with her about it about why she felt like it was so important to include it you know mm -hmm. like it was so important for her and I don't know if she would still stand by this when we had talked about it it's what she stood by but she said in the porn industry you always expect a guy to go down a girl to go down on a guy first before they do anything and it's not the other way around and I was like huh she said so she's like even down to porn like <laughs> Why are we as women, you know, like it was just so interesting. And that was when we had talked about it, that was her um, sort of explanation for that quote. And I was like, you know what, yeah. let's, let's include it, you know? And yeah. so we totally sold that to us because I, I mean, we were thinking about it just on the level of like, Shut um, down, yeah. in yeah. trying to be inclusive, we wanted to make sure that the show was something that a mom could bring her daughter to. <laughs> And so we were like, right. we have young young girls in here. Is this a conversation that maybe like a parent might not want to have right at this very moment? But then yeah. on the other hand, the way that Jasmine was explaining it to us, we we're like, okay, so maybe it is a conversation, maybe not for the six year old, but like for people yeah. who are, have. And so maybe it's worth including for that reason. So she like definitely sold us on that. And I think a lot of that happened was like that internal dialogue between Lindsay and Sarah and I really kind of changed each other's minds about work that if it was just us doing it may or may not have included. Mm. Um, I think it was a really like generative process actually. I think yeah. too, there are lots of conversations that happened and like half of them we'll never know obviously yeah. but I think it's also like what like my husband and I Alex we made that shirt sure that Carmen's wearing the girls again. Like, yeah. Way um, to rest. Um, I mean, um, hand down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's reversed. Oh, so good. And it was interesting because it's like, where does this intersect? Like, can we have, uh, you know, a company, like a t-shirt brand that's not female run, you know, like be a part of it? Yeah, absolutely. But what does it look like 
for it to make sense for that person and then for what we're doing. And I think that was with every artist. And then additionally, like what conversation sort of trickled out from there. Like, I think that there are lots of, like I'm, I'm still getting to talk about it in LA. Like I've had people come up to me that I didn't know, which is wild for them to be like, hey, um, you're the one that did the art show, right? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, it was, I haven't, I think the first step is like, I haven't been to a meaningful event in a really long time like that. Um, and then second is like, the, the art was great, you know, or like, I really appreciated it or I hadn't thought of it like that. Um, so it's, okay. it was warm. Yeah. I, I, outside of like- No, that's really positive. I, I get, I did partially ask that question wondering if there had been like negative pushback, but this is even more encouraging than what I was expecting. There was negative pushback during when we were talking with artists, for sure. Oh, um, there were artists that didn't want to participate because they like weren't really sure on the format. And so we had to kind of do that process of reforming, like to make sure that, cause they kind of brought concerns to us that we maybe hadn't thought of. And so it was really helpful to have feedback um, but it was also hard at times because we constantly were doing that process of like checking ourselves, like questioning our own motives. Like, is what we're trying to do right. by having the show um, creating more, like conversation in the right way? Are we like pushing forward something that is worth talking about, or are we taking advantage of people? And like we had to really check ourselves a couple of times to make sure that. And in the end, I think we struck a good balance, which was like we know we've considered all of this stuff so if there is negative feedback i mean that's something we can learn from but we know that we've thought about it and it's like we're ready for whatever that might look like but i think it's sort of a long time carmen and vanessa were those some of your concerns like when you were approached about this like did you want to make sure that ariel Lindsay, and sarah had certain intentions that were in line with your own line with your own I think when I read the brief, I, and also just like trusting, you know, Sarah's eye and the curators and just knowing that they would put together something that would, I mean, I think, I think knowing Sarah personally kind of helped kind of as far as, you know, me not really being concerned about how it would turn out or like the context of it all. And I think the amazing thing is like going into it, like you said, um, like the conversations that were started as a result of the curation that happened. And so I know Sarah mentioned before that like they tried really hard for it not to be, or just like being aware that it wasn't like in your face, that there was a lot of like well, for, it, for it to be too vulgar or too like feminist or anything. I think, I think, you know, it could have gone a lot of different ways, but the way that it ended up as far as the curation is concerned, it is just like, and for it, to be an all women's show. I think there were specific conversations or, you know, the context of the work, the way that it was sequenced and the way that, you know, you viewed it. I think there were certain conversations that came up that were only a result of that specific, you know, situation and context and mm. like, you know, selection of artists and selection of work. And yeah. just to be able to think about women in that way the, or like the voices that were there you know like the experience that only women specifically will have I think if it was um you know a co-ed show or I don't know if the curation went a, in a different direction then like the conversations would be really different and so I mean as far as being worried about the way that my work is placed amongst the others I I mean I, I wasn't worried about it personally <laughs> I just I'm, trusted them and I like I gave them my work and yeah. I was like okay I know like you're trying to you know uh initiate specific conversations um and so I kind of like let them do that I think the so what Carmen's saying is the best example that we had um because in, in my dream world that's how it happens it's like I know <laughs> the that I'm working with always right um but to have a 16 a female like artist show um we didn't know a lot of the artists we reached out to and some of them were just like straight fangirls you know like <laughs> and like cold call instagram dm like the whole thing and so with carmen's example that was the best case scenario mm -hmm. uh, vanessa's like mid-level in there because it's their friend of a friend so there's still that cosign right but there's um <clears throat> a few artists that we had reached out to that and I'm going to make it confidential right here, right now. We didn't pay anyone to be part of the show. Yeah. Um, and that was my biggest 
like hardest, I think, gripe, um, especially because we had a sponsor for the show. And the sponsor for the show was essentially paying for the magazine, which mm. watched and was the reason for the show. So internally, that was my whole mental breakdown um, that I shared with the curators and with the artists. Um, and there were some artists that really had a problem with it, um, which I get, right? So one artist was, um, you know, she emailed me and Ariel back saying like, my example of feminism um, says that women should be paid for their work. You know, and it was like, really yeah. jarring yeah. for me and Ariel because <laughs> we are like, we agree. It's our, our example of feminism says that too. No, like we want, to, we would love to pay you and we would pay you before we pay ourselves. And it's just like, ah, oh, man, we like, we want to work in that. We want to be part of that creative economy that's equitable yeah. for people, for women, right? But that, you know. And yeah, actually, we have a question from an attendee right now, Alvin G, that's totally relevant to what we're discussing. And he asks, what were some examples of concerns artists brought up that helped guide your process? Yeah, so it was that. And I think that was the biggest one was like, are we paying these women to be a part of? And then it's been my it's it's been in my periphery and she actually wasn't a part of the show. So now it's like this constant, hey, Vanessa, it's this constant, um, I just cringe. you know, in the back of my, are we, should we not be doing it if we're not able to pay people? Is that irresponsible? I mean, my experience as an artist, like that you approach, I um, felt like, okay, doing it once we had a conversation about it, you know, like I was on board as soon as you guys, you know, left my apartment after this like, long and intense conversation about right your intentions and what your vision was for the show. You know, once that was clear and, you know, once, you know, you guys were pretty transparent with the entire thing. You guys were pretty and that was, you know, an example of what good kind of negotiation was for, you know, women working together. Um, and we were just trying to build something that was empowering and that was, a, you know, this open and honest space. That was just like a, okay, I'm down. <laughs> yeah. Was the challenge? Sorry. Not being able to pay some artists and that is where, and then not being able to meet with some of the artists. Cause I think yeah. that you're, yeah, it's like, you're able to sniff out, like people are so, it's so easy to read people. I think these days, mm. especially if you're an artist or you're, create, you're creative, like that whole, you know, and I felt like she was confusing me with someone who says like, hey, we have no budget, but it's great for your portfolio. You know, like, hey, it's great for exposure, like that classic like freelance line. Um, but then we were saying it really meant it actually. You know? yeah. And I think that if you don't know me and um, the other thing I'll say about the artist and again, let's, let's take it, let's take it there. We're here. She was a <laughs> color as well, you know? And so I think Ariel and I immediately, we got in pretty defensive like, she knew us like she would know that we're like, this, you know like she didn't get it and like xyz and and then and then we had sort of had to take a step back and like she must she must have been burned like before or she must have been taken advantage of as we all have you know mm -hmm. like, enough times in order for her to respond this way like, or she's just not down when that which is fine too we were trying to be upfront and transparent. We felt like, you know, if she only knew us and she only knew what we were trying to achieve, like maybe, you know, she wouldn't be upset. And then we started to think more about it. Like, you know, maybe that it's really actually good that there are women who are really standing up for their ethics in business. Cause like to be an artist, you have to also have like a certain business savvy and you have to draw a line sometimes. And it, it, it applies to everything. Like I've, I've done a lot of like really shitty kind of paid internships. And to get to the career that I have, I, I felt like I had to do that. And I wish I didn't have to do it because I wish I could have been paid for my work. And I hope that when I'm in a position of power, you know, to be hiring interns, that I'm going to do that in a different way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I thought it was actually great to see her draw a hard line and say, this is my fee for group shows. And that's just the way that I'm working. And, you know, I, I commend her for that, actually. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, thank you for also just sharing this open-minded respect for like the way other people might approach an all-woman yeah. show like, yeah like what I get from you is that you know you did it this way and that was true to the three of you but there are obviously other ways that other women might approach it 
-hmm. And actually, since Sarah already brought it there, there is a hard question I wanted to ask, which is, is there a difficult experience that you can remember as a female creative that particularly highlighted what makes it hard to be a female in the creative industry? <laughs> I know, it's, it's a Black place. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Well, I think, no, I'm not going to start. Start. It's someone else. Start. No, I, <laughs> I can see Carmen me. laughing, even if we can't hear her. So, I think for me, it is playing into the stereotype that people expect me to. And that's been really hard for me. So it's like, I'm already not a business person. I hate talking about money. I hate it. And so then to like go into business meetings, let's say, and to be sort of this like meek, like Asian American, like um, female who maybe isn't as assertive and like, you're going to be able to talk me down and I'm going to say, okay, you know, and you know, I've been, I've it's so silly. I've been called out for um, saying like, thank you too much. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I can say thank you. <laughs> I can be grateful. Like, that's okay. But yeah. It's so odd that like it comes off as this like um, almost apologetic, you know, and um, it happens at work, you know, like I uh, work at an agency that's New York uh, based and I'm the only person in LA. So I'm like, I'm, th I'm, th I'm just so thankful, you know, whatever. And they're like, you don't have to say that, you know, or um, it's, it's really interesting. I'm trying to think of where else like. Actually, Sarah, uh, since you've sort of hinted on it by saying Asian American, we have a question from an attendee, Sue Kim, and she says, specifically for you, yeah. have you explored Korean feminism at all? There seems to be a movement that's growing and wanted to get thoughts. Uh, so it's interesting. Korean feminism, interestingly, I think I've talked to Vanessa a lot about it more than anyone else because they have a group called Asian Mamas, which <laughs> I was like, this is dope. So in my mind, I think for me, it, it's like the same thing as being a, a woman, then, then add that layer of being Korean American woman to it, right? It's like, does it have to be, do I need to make like something that has like, like hunger on it, which is like Korean, you know, symbols, like, like, does it have to be that? Or is there a way to do it that's not like so Korean, I guess, like, you know, and I think that's the same thing about being a female. Like, am I doing it in a way that's like, am I pushing it all the way there? Am I like, I can play with, with the guys, you know, like I'm cool. So I think wow. it makes it a bit of an odd like place to, and I think for me, for you, Sue, like it was really hard for me to like realize that I'm, I've had, this is a whole nother talk, but I'm not Korean enough and yet I'm not white enough. Right? I'm not Korean Korean, but I'm not like American enough. So it's been this interesting like middle space to play. And then getting to talk to Vanessa about it after having had the show and meeting her and Sally, who now have this group called Asian Mamas. Suddenly it's so interesting for me to explore within the context of what they're doing. Oh, like they did that in a way that didn't seem so, I guess like Korean in quotes and um, not knowing what that means for me, even exploring what that means and seeing the way that they're able to sort of um, dissect it and translate it visually. And I'm like, wow, I, I hadn't thought to do it that way. Or I hadn't thought that I would have resonated with something like that. So I might let Vanessa go <laughs> in there and slide in. I mean, I think the work is inherently tied to my identity as an Asian American woman, right? right? And so the conversation is there whether or not it's brought up um just because of the work you know straight itself is made by an asian american woman and one thing that we try to keep in mind when we're you know creating these spaces whether it's asian mamas or talking to sarah and a couple other friends is you know yes we have this identity but also how are we using it how are we creating it how are we making it inclusive for you know, marginalized Asian women, so Southeast Asian women or trans Asian women, you know, just like really pushing the envelope to be beyond, you know, so insular, uh, beyond such a uh, like homogenous thing, you know, and then integrating that into our conversations, I think, uh, is just kind of like an example of what feminism should be, this dialogue, this ongoing dialogue that is transformed um, when other people are uh, introduce when you know other groups are uh, involved uh, because I want to be aware of our time I kind of want to 
ask you guys questions that are beyond the show and sort of yeah. about being a female creative in general and where you think the future is going to sort of head. So a question I have is, do you have practical solutions in mind regarding the price gap and representation gap for female creatives and male creatives? I think Arielle mentioned this earlier as well about yeah. like, because I know you're a curator and you work in that um, field of putting on shows and the ratio is really off, right? So what is a real way that we can change that? Well, I mean, it's kind of, it's like an interesting model because there's just like such a massive separation between uh, these kind of like pop-up events or things that are going on in the culture that are like younger and more like running on no budget and doing all that. And I, I see like a lot of progress going on in that field, um, like at a, at a more local level. Um, but we still just like haven't caught up institutionally. Um, yeah. so, like when we're talking about like big galleries, like blue chip gallery or museum shows, solo shows for women, like the numbers between like 1985, the number of shows, I think there was like one like female retrospective, like female retrospective one woman show one yeah. in 1985. And there were four in 2015. And that's between Guggenheim, Matt, Modern, and Whitney. So yeah. it's kind of like between 1985, 2015, we only added three shows <laughs> for women. It's like things like that are just really discouraging. But at the same time, like I see so much progress at this local level and in a younger generation. And so I think as, you know, people who are our age, like rise into um, kind of like upper level management or uh, curatorial positions, things like that, I see a lot of hope that these things can change. And I think it takes those more grassroots kind of things like this uh, to move the needle a little bit. And another huge part of the problem is the market too, so buying. Um, and that's, okay. you know, now working in a new capacity, doing kind of like a more consulting role. Um, as I'm working on projects, I'm really, really mindful to like look at where my dollars are going to go. Like how much dollars for this project are going to female artists versus male artists, people of color versus white people. Like it's just important to be really critical of the way that we're spending our money because that creates a creative economy and without the creative economy, like for example, if Carmen didn't make money doing commercial photography, she probably wouldn't be able to say, you know what, I'm going to do this fine art exhibition, even though I'm not getting paid for it. Right. She might do it anyway, because <laughs> my point is just that, it's harder for women to, you know, be in a position to be financially stable and also have an art practice. So if we're spending our dollars in a smart way, um, you know, we can really support women to make the work that they want to make. And if, if we're not putting our money where our values are, then it's just not going to be possible for us. So it's important to really be mindful of, of that as well as like at the institutional level, what we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Actually, since you brought up, uh, Carmen and getting paid as a commercial photographer. I was wondering if Carmen and Vanessa, as photographer and an artist, you think about when you quote, well, whether there's a difference in your quote between what a male photographer or a male artist might be asking. Does that factor into yeah. your decisions? Um, I, I don't really think of it that way. And I, and I know that there's a huge disparity between the number of male photographers and female photographers. And I did want to mention, like Eugene brought this up too in the Make and Slack channel. There's this website that was created recently by a female photographer. It's womenphotograph.com. And they have, I can't remember how many people they have listed, but it's hundreds of women now um, who have over five years of photojournalism experience. And it's basically a push and a huge roster of women all over the world. Um, kind of a resource for editors and art buyers to specifically hire women photographers and the body of work is incredible and I think um I think something like that is amazing and they're also you know they just, uh gifted like a grant and scholarship to a few photographers to support their practice and their projects and they also have a mentorship program so I think things like that are definitely you know a move in the right direction um personally I don't think about that and I and I don't know that when I work with um producers and um people that I hire out to help me put together estimates I don't think they I don't think 
when they quote that there's a difference between i think they just look at the body of work yeah and they create fees based on the you know based on your talent and what you're providing um and i think the fees for editorial are not different as far as i know um when i speak to fellow male photographers they give me advice too and i as far as i know like there's no difference there i think the biggest difference is the uh, maybe just what's out there in the market like ariel said and so it's for art buyers and editors to make a bigger effort to support female photographers and also be aware that the vision and the results that you're going to get from female is going to be different. So I think, I, I know that what they do consider is, you know, that's why they do portfolio meetings is they want to meet the photographer in person so that, you know, say, for example, there's a very, you know, sensitive subject that needs to be covered or, you know, person who needs to be photographed and to hire a female photographer because they know that they're going to be more suitable for that job. And so I think, you know, those things need to be considered. And even like going into fashion week, I think, the stuff that I'm going to capture is going to be a lot different from what a male photographer is going to capture. And like, you know, the male gaze, I think is very different from the female gaze and yeah. like sensitivity and the way that even you interact with the models backstage. Yeah. I think, I don't, I don't know if I'm being, you know, partial or like stereotyping, but I, I, I would like to think, and especially like seeing and experiencing what it's like backstage, I would like to think that I am more sensitive to their situation just like to their situation, you know, innate as the female. Yeah. Innate as the female. I mean, speaking on what Carmen said about kind of the approach to, you know, being sensitive, um, on the other hand, as an artist, as a young artist, um, and just beginning to price my work and thinking about how, you know, this is a business too, um, I do have to consider, you know, what like my value is I guess the the value of the work um, and such, and then thinking about like installation and having you know people approach me when I'm trying to install a piece like oh do you need help? Whereas you know a guy who has this huge sculpture would never be you know asked that like I can handle my own work you know I I know how to install the work that I've created. Um, you don't need to hire someone else. Whereas that question would never be asked to a guy who's you know a male identifying person who's installing their work you know and then having that be considered when you're um when you're you know in the process of um, negotiating prices like oh we have to hire this person to help you install but you know that shouldn't have had come up anyway yeah i have some very practical ways i feel like someone brought it up to me and this is create not creative at all but it's like finding for me someone said oh yeah I have a doctor who's a female and like my optometrist and whoever else I go to are female doctors or female physicians or a banker or whatever it is like that you can choose um to go to and supporting women run things or businesses I think second to that too it, it's interesting I um do a lot of influencer marketing at the agency that I work at and <clears throat> oftentimes women don't ask for more money Mm. Um, men always ask for more and mm -hmm. if I have more I'll give them more but if <clears throat> you as a female are not asking me for more I can't give you more so I'm not just gonna say like because I have to make my budget right as someone who's then like making sure this budget is right um mm -hmm. so it's, it's interesting now when I'm talking to friends who are in, like influential in whatever way shape or form like ask for more yeah. or make sure you're not like what are you asking for like, let's have rates. Like, let's let's just go there. Like, if we're close enough, you know, um, that's way under budget. Don't do that, right? So <clears throat> I think being on, like, the marketer side, like, in, in terms of, like, my own agency work, right? And then for me, it's this whole, like, it's this weird, like, Robin Hood thing, you know? It's like, if I'm able to do work, like, passion project work and with anyone, right, then how can I get this artist who I believe in, like, I'm paid on this next like advertising thing that I'm doing, you know, or how can I include them as, as a photographer we should work with, right? Mm. Versus um, versus the list of the people that we usually go to. When can I insert this person at the right moment, right? Yeah. In an yeah. artist club, like, you know, I have 16 female artists that we could potentially work with, right? So, yeah. um, so I think it's being just with the 
know-how and and the experience that I've had and like sharing that with the people I can share it with like brands have money to spend you know it's interesting I can't get my magazine paid for but I can like tell my (laughs) friends how much they should be charging you know but if I know that just that fact alone like most women do not ask for more you know or do you need a manager you know like would it be easier for you to ask for more to get a manager our friend tara was a part of the show too she just had a show in new york and her friends came through the night before her show and repriced everything to much higher and everything sold you know and like maybe it's it's I think it's a few things like you have to know what you're trying to achieve, who you have time for and how to carve out like solutions for people too. You know, I don't think you can like save the world, you know, but I think in as much as you can do in that day with as much wisdom as you have, you have to do what you feel like is is possible and making a difference, I think. So it's whether I can get a, a friend paid, you know, whose work obviously speaks for itself that to me feels great. Or if, if I know someone's working with a big brand and they're not charging enough, I'm like, yo, big brand. charge that, charge way more, charge double that next time. You know, yeah. because I can say that now with my experience, right? Um, or finding a female doctor. Like, so I can pay her versus paying, like my sister is a doctor and this is going through a whole different thing of like struggling in residency and what it looks like to be a female doctor versus a male doctor. And I'm like, this conversation's happening everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, like, how do we push it forward and how do we make decisions without feeling overwhelmed by the, by what's at hand, you know, and making daily decisions in our own life that, that we can, or is there a conversation that you could take to the next level or be like, hey, what do you mean by that? Actually? Mm. Yeah, you know? actually you've, you've gone perfectly into the next question I had, which is what are some practical things that you can do to foster young female artists, curators, photographers, creatives of all kinds. I know that some of you have taught in the past or are currently teaching. Are these, besides education, like, which is a, you can talk about, but what are other things that we can do to help young girls who want to be in this industry? I have a really good one. Actually, I was thinking about this this morning. Like I was thinking about art history and that path and like how I kind of got there and how I got here and all these things. And Um, I remember when I was uh, finishing undergrad, applying for grad school, I asked a female professor of mine, actually all my letter writers were female professors. Mm. uh, And I asked one of them to write a letter for me. And her response was like, yes, I'll definitely write a letter for you because you've done good work, but I want you to know something before you apply to grad school. And that is that um, art history is a really difficult or, you know, academia in general, it's a really difficult path for women. And she was like, why do you think it is that all the girls, like all the people in your classes are girls? It's like 85% girls, but all the administration, all the professors are men. She was like, because like women's careers will always come second to men. Like when you want to have children, you're going to have to readjust your expectations. You're going to have to take time off of work. Your career is going to suffer. Your tenure, you're not going to get tenure till later, blah, 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 all these things. I just want you to have that piece of information going forward. I just want you to know that this is what you're entering into. And I was like shook to the ground by that, first of all. And then second of all, I just was like, do I even want this person to write me a letter now if she's already like questioning my judgment in choosing this career path? And so I I think of that very often when I'm thinking about mentorship, because I think it's a huge, important piece of our role as women is to mentor other. Yeah. And so my answer to that is, uh, for example, when I was installing exhibitions at the museum, I would always get interns to help me. And um, I would use that as an opportunity to talk to them about their goals and talk to them about what they imagine themselves doing and what connections do I have? Like, who can I get them a lunch date with so they can Uh hang out and ask their questions to somebody. And like, we all have had like both the positive and the negative version of that, which is like somebody telling you like, you can't do it, but also somebody telling you I'm here to support you and ask questions. Like Sarah has been that for me in a lot of ways. We have different careers, but I always like bounce stuff, have always bounced stuff off of her. Um, only being a few years older than me, but it's still been super helpful. So I think that's like a huge part of our job right now as creative women is to go out and find younger creative women and tell them, hey, it's going to be difficult, but I know people and you know people and you have a a great eye or great abilities and like together we can make this happen. We can change 
the discussion around this. It doesn't always have to, the demographics don't always have to look the way they look. Like we have the ability to change that. So creating pipelines between, you know, younger artists and older artists and, you know, creating clear, you know, communicative, passive communication so you know even this conversation where we're talking about negotiating uh you know prices for your work or talking about um these important issues or you know misogyny in the workplace you know you're encouraging women to kind of explore that yeah there's a question that just came through anonymous attendee um how much time are you willing to uh, to devote to help bring up young talent? I ha- my mentor is actually not a female; he's a male, and um, his name's Evan Kubernick. And <clears throat> he started um, like Slam Double XL Zero to Sixty. I worked at a men's magazine called Antenna with him for a number of years. Um, his whole thing was he would always try and bring in new talent, always, always, always. Like the art director at GQ now is. Evan met him when he was an intern in college, right? So <clears throat> there's always going to be this um, threat that someone's going to be better than you. There are, I think I'm actually supremely confident that there are a lot of people who are better than me at making magazines, but I have my own perspective and that's what I ride on. So <clears throat> to bring up new talent to me, and I saw this by example through Evan, it only helps my cause because it's this, it's this like influencer thing too. It's like, I am not going to be the BL end all. I don't need to be. My magazine doesn't need to be. But if I can continue to be that person who's putting other people on, then I become that curator of that person. Like, oh, Sarah knows the young talent who's coming up. Or Sarah actually is really confident about putting other people on. Like, we should probably tap her. And then that's like my fee. <laughs> like, how much, how much am I charging you to like tap me for those contacts? But <clears throat> for the most part, I think that you being nervous about putting other people on and then that hindering you fostering into other people, it shows a lack of, it shows insecurity. One, I'll start there. You need to be confident in your own work. And if you don't have maybe the time to pour into other people, then you should be focusing on your own work, you know, and getting to a place where you're more secure about that work maybe and feel confident enough to be able to share like your challenges and your failing. And I think, also, m- my vision is this like, sort of greater good or like greater goal um, in what it would look like to push this creative conversation forward. Like as yeah. we're doing now, like this feels like a step, right? Yeah. Um, but, or is my goal to like make a lot of money making a magazine? If it was, it, I would make a, a magazine, right? Um, and then yeah. do X, Y, and Z and get my name out there, right? Um, I think it starts with your goal, right? So if if my goal is to try and push this creative conversation, this landscape forward and include women and men, right? People who are the right fit, um, then I'm going to continue to pour into people, right? Um, and still be confident about my own work and make time for my work and then also make time for those people. So I can say, hey, remember like, <clears throat> Madbury Club, for example, if you guys know who they are, who I adore. Um, I gave them their first print article at Antenna when they were under 21 years old. And like, like, I feel like they'll always remember that. Like they always bring it up, you know, whenever I'm around them and with them, but they're crushing it, you know? And so like, I don't have any threats about that. They're phenomenal, right? Like <clears throat> there's enough room for everyone. And I think when I had very first started my magazine, I was very like, I want to do it like that. And then all these other female magazines that are coming out, I don't want to do it. And Evan Kubernick was just like, there's enough room one and it only helps if there's more two and three it, it's not your perspective right mm-hmm. so even if you guys all know the same people you guys know them differently mm-hmm. right whoever's making xyz other female there's a ton of beautiful female print like focused magazines out just print in general right so um i think it, it comes from like what your goal is one my goal is to help foster this creative community and like make it wider and whatever that looks like for me in this season um there are seasons where i've spread myself too thin and I felt like there are worse definitely people who are getting hired for the job that I was recommending but before me. And I had to reassess, like, is my work not on point enough? Am I then only being seen as a person who's able to put other people on when I'm not helping myself, right? So, so can I suggest myself for that thing versus that other person, right? So mm-hmm. I think it's assessing what your goal is, assessing what season you're in to do what, and then and then going from there. You know, I think it takes a really confident person to pour into other people to talk about their struggles and to save that person from that stress. Cause if that mm-hmm. photographer makes it faster 
and then feels indebted to you or like can harken back or you know whatever that is that feels much more important to me mm-hmm. yeah yeah okay i want to be respectful of your time because i do know that it's uh one est now but we have a couple of audience questions so is it okay if you stick around for a little bit yes please. everyone cool uh, i know ariel's at work so let me know if you need a hop um <laughs> let's go with connor m said He's actually addressing something we talked about a while back. Can, can you get you guys can see the questions if you mm-hmm. click into Q and A at the bottom. Um, he's addressing something we talked a bit back about being Asian American and having or being female or and also possibly Asian American for some of us um, and having people perceive us a certain way. So how do we as women walk a tightrope of being strong, independent, and intelligent? without appearing to other people as seemingly too aggressive when we're talking about our work. And I think he's talking about like, how do we be true to ourselves while battling what some people come with? Like some people will come with their perception of us. Mm -hmm. And do we feel the need to like adjust? I know Sarah's like, no. (laughs) It's like a Donald Trump supporter. Right, let's say, like, I'm not gonna sway you, sway you neither here nor there, but I'm gonna like use my personality and like who I am to voice my opinion, right? So, like, Connor, I hear your question, I understand, and like what you're saying. I, like, I did say, like, two feminists, right? And so, I think it's interesting. Um, that means so many different things to so many different people. Um, for Vanessa, it could mean a completely different thing than it does for mm-hmm. We're all in the same show together, right? So, for me, it's like, Whatever that means for me, I want to be able to bridge a gap to have a conversation. And again, it's like, it starts with what your goal is, right? Like our goal was to open up dialogue for this conversation. It wasn't to like, take that guys. You know, it wasn't that like equal pay now. Then that's what, that's what the show would have been called. Right. Um, um, It felt much more, I guess, I don't know what the right word is because it's all depends on your, your level of, uh, like temperament, I guess. Mild, I would say. Like, I think it could have been much more aggressive. But we're trying to have a, a conversation just trying to offend or not offend. Right? I'm not, like, not trying to offend anyone, but I'm also, like, not trying to throw it in your face, right? Um, I mean, there, yeah. So it, it's totally up to, like, I think every woman here would answer differently. And for me, it's about having a conversation with someone to be able to not, not persuade them, but change their just perspective a little bit. Just change out that lens. Or I mean, like, that shouldn't be our job. We yeah. we shouldn't even have to like have to talk about being too aggressive or too mm-hmm. mild. You know, the thing that like, you know, people talk about this all the time. You know, if uh, a ma- a woman is strong or she's called a bitch or whatever, uh, if a man is doing that as a boss, he's a boss or whatever. Sorry, that could have been put much more eloquently. But in the same way, we shouldn't have to worry about being too aggressive or too mild. It should just be taken as what it is, you know, and the fact that Sarah has to defend, you know, this kind of like situation, I, you know, it's ridiculous, I think. And also, like, certainly there are women who probably like look at their own way of doing and are like, it's not far enough, right? And like, I think that's a really valid opinion too. And like, what we were, you know, trying to do is like not put forward our own ideas necessarily, but just create a space where people could have that conversation and like meet each other wherever they were at. And I know like in uh, Make Him Slack channel, Eugene has brought up a couple of times like, okay, but like, what are the tactics that I can use? Like, I'm trying to be a good man, trying to be like feminist as a man. And like, what what do I do? How do I like enter the situation? And I think that's a huge, huge, huge part of what we were trying to do is to say, look, we can't tell you how that's going to look for you, but we want you to like enter into this space, listen to what people are saying, look at the work, try to put yourself into the mindset of the women who are making it work and you enter in there and then you do from there what feels right to you. You like make that a part of your economy, like how you spend your money. You make that part of how you speak about women's work. Mm-hmm. You make that, you know, part of just what you observe as being part of those conversations so it was it was like about creating a space and like the idea of like two feminists right like I feel like I interpret that more from like agendas sometimes 
Um, but I don't think this was like an agenda pushing show or like, I don't think, I mean, we certainly all have our own feminist agendas. Like we were saying earlier about the female artist who told us like, well, my feminism says this, well, we all have a version of that. My feminism says X. And so I think, you know, that's a person to person conversation. Whereas like with the show, it was intended to be more of like, you're getting a slice, you're getting in a room with a lot of people with a lot of different opinions. Yeah. Actually, we have a question from an attendee, Stanley, that does speak to what you were saying about Eugene, asking about what he can do, or constantly questioning, like, what is man practically to do in this situation? And the question is about us in saying that there needs to be more all-women initiatives. The question is, would it be more productive to convince the so-called people in power, whether they're male or not, is to use a more holistic approach. I think the idea is like, if we like, if convince women first, then we have to go ahead and then like, as a, as a unit, as all women trying to convince men. So would it be easier to just like include men from the get go? I think what that kind of sounds like, or the, the idea of like, we have to first convince the people in power or that we have to make the people in power part of the conversation like a bit like kind of trickle down economics like oh well if we just convince the museum directors then yeah. they'll definitely do more women shows and then women will feel more valued and I think that's I think on some level that that's true but on another on another point you know we we do have to do the work of convincing each other first and I think it's going to be this like generational shift more so than just trying to like march up to the front door and protest like I I think that that's effective in some way but I think what is more effective is like starting kind of within ourselves and then starting using the creative communities around us to start to like spread those ideas forward. And I think in our creative circles as women, there are men. So yeah. if, if they are benefiting from these conversations, um, you know, I think that's really positive, but I don't think I have to do the show for them. Right. I don't know. And we're not doing this, you know, like separately. It's not just one singular moment where we're only creating women shows from here on out. It's yeah. part of a bigger picture. It's part of a bigger dialogue and a constant, you know, consistent conversation we're having every day, you know. So this is part of it, you know, creating a holistic approach, approaching people of power, um, including men, all of those things. Do you feel like there's sufficient support from men in your workplaces, in your personal circles, towards your journey as a female creative? I, I have a pretty brand new job, and it's actually mostly women. Okay. Um, but I think the men that are here are extremely supportive. Um, That's great. The owners of my company are women, but I have men that you know have the same position as I do, and I think everybody is just super supportive of each other. And, um, but I have definitely had work situations where I felt, um, I felt like lesser than male colleagues or mm -hmm. I felt, uh, lesser than male, you know, uh, professors or museum directors or whatever. Um, so I think it just, it varies from place to place, I would say, you know, like, you know, my, my peers will validate me and, you know, include me in shows, but when it comes to professors hiring a studio assistant they're going to choose the guy over me you know that's an example so you know again like larger picture if you see the the world um you know, we are pro like there is progress and there is you know vast men and you know women are being more and more empowered to do this but look at the demographics of the spaces of power they're still so skewed um you know, until until like those spaces of power reflect the demographics of our actual world, it's not enough. But I mean, that's just my opinion. But yeah, there's always room to grow and contribute. And men can always, you know, contribute. Yeah, <laughs> actually, Ariel and Vanessa, you guys, we were clearing questions. And then what you said just sparked another one from yeah. Chris Dumas. He says, do you hope to reach a world where feminism is no longer a thing and society is fair and equal between men and women? And if so, if yes, do you think there's a part of it that helps fuel creativity and motivation that will cause female creatives to drop off or there'll be less of them wanting to get into it without a second purpose yeah. for pushing female rights? 
I mean, feminism isn't just about like this equal equality. It's about, you know, empowering ourselves being, you know, I feel like it's, it's presumptuous to assume that, you know, feminism is this one definition where we're trying to fight for, uh, like fair and equal between men and women. Um, it, you know, this question is so good because it just reflects, you know, what feminism can be to some people and, you know, what it means to be a feminist today. Um, right now, a lot of feminists are fighting for um, fair and equal, uh, but for some feminism, for f some feminists, including me, I, I think I try to include, um, you know, something that like goes beyond just this one aspect of being a woman. Um, there is this aspect of not being paid equally. There's this aspect of not being able to walk alone at night sometimes because I'm, you know, fearing being, I'm in danger of being attacked. But it's also like, um, how can I better myself as a woman? Uh, what does it mean to be feminine as opposed to masculine? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Does it, you know, what do you guys think? <laughs> This is going to just sound really academic, so I'll just keep it, like, really short, but this is, like, the thing that I'm probably best at doing is, like, kind of, like, academic moments. <laughs> uh, so my, and this is, again, like, utopian sort of, like, academia thing, but, like, uh, my understanding of feminism is that it is not a movement. It's a set of tactics that we can use so uh, it's, a, it's a set of prescriptions and a set of ways to organize. And so yeah. the feminist movement, uh, like an I'm with her thing or something, like that, it's not that. It's just we can take feminist tactics and we can apply that to um, dealing with uh, you know, being undocumented or being whatever mm -hmm. the here, like whatever that looks like. Um, the feminist movement really like laid the groundwork for a lot of these other movements around equality for marginalized people. And so... Yeah. It's really just uh, a way that we can access tactics and descriptions and all these things, right? So it's like, uh, it doesn't have to be, okay, the movement is to get from here to here. And once we've achieved okay, the movement is stop. It's not that. It's just we're using this knowledge um, to push everybody forward. Men, women, uh, especially like men of color, still marginalized. Mm -hmm. We've got to stop that too. So like, I think feminist tactics can be used there it's like it's really just what we can do with it and it's not that there's a goal and we just have to get here and then we can survive right exactly it's all right i yeah no sarah go ahead go ahead I, yeah. I think one thing there's a piece that aaron riley had made and it's like um like bloody tampon knit into like this woven tapestry <clears throat> if men like men and women like if let's say that that happens right men and women, like, if, we're still gonna have our period. <laughs> we're still gonna like. There's still gonna be art made about it. Like, there's still gonna be intrinsic things that like make like there's you no know, men and female different, right? And there's not to say that there couldn't be an all male show for sure. Go for it, you know. But I think that there are certain aspects of being like we're just angry now because like we're taxed. Like there are like royalty taxes on tampons and like pads. It's so crazy, right? Like birth control, right? So crazy. But it's like we're making art about that. But let's say that there is no tax. Let's say that. But they were free, like condoms are, or whatever, right? Um, I think art would still be made about those things, right? So regardless, like, um, that it's it's kind of what Vanessa went back to, like, that it's not just about being equal, it's about getting to a place where we're talking about that without this, like, that presumption. Yeah. Okay, I could honestly continue talking to you guys, but I think we have gone over time enough now. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much to each of you. Uh, on the screen right now are some places that the attendees can see more about you, um, follow you, find out what you're up to next. Uh, do any of you guys want to plug something that you're doing right now, something that's coming up? Okay. <laughs> Right. Um, I'm just gonna explain Macon one more time. This recording is gonna be made available on Macon.com. Um, and we have a wonderful feature with Sarah that tells more about the show as well on the site. They can go listen to that. Um, thank you, all of you. I Thanks hope everyone. You like this again. Yeah. I love you all very much. 10 out of 10. You too, 10 out of 10. Amazing, wonderful. <laughs> all right.
Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.